Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, attending this morning's session. Uh, as Nassif indicated, I've been invited to talk a little bit about my organization, the U.S. market, some of the legal requirements that are necessary for bringing product into the U.S. market, and then I'll complete my, con my discussion by talking about our recycling efforts in the U.S. market. Uh, first of all, who am I? I'm with the International, Tra International Sleep Products Association. ISPA is the trade association for the mattress industry. We've been around over a little over 100 years. Uh, we represent about 700 companies from around the world. We're primarily U.S. focused in terms of mattress production, but we have um, members from Europe, Africa, Asia, throughout the world. Uh, we host a trade show every two years. It's called the ISPA Expo. The next one will be in 2024 in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and then in 2013, ISPA formed the Mattress Recycling Council. MRC is a separate company. I'm, I'm president of both companies. MRC was established to implement recycling laws in three states, California, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. In 2024, we will be expanding to a fourth state named Oregon. Next. ISPA's mission is to lead and advance the interests of the sleep products industry. Our vision is to help the world sleep better. We have six strategic goals. The first is to provide data and knowledge to the industry. How big is the market? What are the trends? What's moving things, the, the market? Uh, what can we expect in the future? The second is to understand the consumer so that our manufacturers and suppliers can take consumer needs into account when they're designing and marketing new products. And then we also want to be able to communicate effectively with the consumer so that when she comes to the store, she's ready to buy the mattress and we can close the sale. The third is advocacy. ISPA plays an important role for the industry in uh, discussing issues with government regulators, legislators, and, and others that shape public policy. We take on issues that individual manufacturers cannot deal with on their own. Uh, we also want the mattress industry to be as inclusive as possible. We're not just here for the big players, we represent the entire industry. The major players, the medium players, and the small family-owned companies. They're all important to the industry, they're innovative, they're creative, they're competitive. Uh, we also want to be open for all suppliers, manufacturers, and we also want to include the retailers in the discussion because only by working together can we make the industry better. Um, in terms of the U.S. market, the, over time, uh, the total number, the, the total revenue that we are generating in the United States at wholesale is gradually increasing. But part of that increase is, uh, over the last year, driven by inflation. Next slide. As you can see from a unit per perspective, we're trending down, unfortunately. Um, the, the, uh, we're seeing that the, the number of units sold has diminished, especially in the, the last couple of years. Next slide. But what that means is that if you have revenues going up, units going down, your average unit price is increasing. That suggests that we are being more successful in persuading consumers that they need to buy a better bed. That you shouldn't be looking only at price when you're buying your mattress. You need to understand, is this mattress meeting my needs? And maybe I need to get a better bed. So what's changing? We have a number of different uh, factors that are creating uh, change and, and disruption in the industry. Uh, the first is boxed bedding. The way that we deliver beds to the consumer is changing, and that's disrupting things very much. One impact is that it's much easier for the online community to sell mattresses now. Uh, that's forced a complete rethink in the U.S. industry, at least, in terms of how mattresses are marketed uh, and sold. The brick and mortar companies are now online. The online companies are now starting to open stores so that everybody is trying to sell through multiple channels, either online, in stores, or a combination. 
Imports are also becoming a huge factor in the U.S. market. Imports have been as much as 25% of the U.S. market. They're fluctuating. Uh, we've had some, some trade cases, some anti-dumping cases in the United States that have excluded some companies, some countries from the U.S. market, but other companies and countries are coming back in. So I think imports will be here to stay for quite a while in the U.S. market. Uh, we also have motion foundations uh, that are changing the way that we sell product. Um, that's raising the, the purchase price for, for uh, the betting sector, which is good, uh, but it's also making a disconnect between how consumers buy their mattresses. Ten years ago, most mattress customers would buy both a mattress and a foundation at the same time. Now that connection is, is breaking, and so we're having more and more consumers who are buying only the mattress um, or buying a mattress and then a base from another company. And that has, that's changing how we're marketing our product. Uh, and then consumer preferences are changing. We're starting to see consumers looking for more in their mattresses. Uh, there's more electronics that are coming into the mattresses from a, a massage or um, a sound uh, uh, benefit. Uh, there are other uh, changes that are going on because of the, the uh, motion foundations. Next slide. We think that the box bedding market trend will continue over time. Certainly during COVID, it increased dramatically as consumers bought more online and stayed out of the stores. Uh, we've seen it de decline a little bit as the world has reopened, but I think that we will continue to see box bedding increasing gradually over time. Next. So what are the consequences of the box bed phenomena? Uh, certainly, it, it has been a big uh, uh, encouragement to online sales. Uh, it's lowered price points in general. It's required the industry to respond with different products, different materials. Uh, how do we make fabrics that recover more quickly? Uh, how do we build springs that can be put in a box? Um, one of the negatives of the whole box bed uh, trend has been the longer return period. In the United States, it's not uncommon to have a 10-month or even a 12-month return period. And I think this is a bad thing for the U.S. market because it's one of those features that's hard to change once you've created it. Uh, it's creating tremendous costs for the uh, mattress companies in terms of returns, and I think it's something that we have to live with for a long time. One of the good things is it's created a shorter replacement cycle, though. Consumers who buy online tend to replace their product more quickly. I don't know if that's because the quality is different or if their, their lifestyle is different so that they want to replace product more frequently. But that's one of the things we're seeing. Uh, but it's also just changed the whole relationship between traditional suppliers and now the online suppliers, as well as the whole distribution process. Next slide. To get a better understanding of consumers, our International Sleep Products Association has created the Better Sleep Council. The Better Sleep Council, or BSC as we call it, uh, looks at consumers. We do surveys on a regular basis. How satisfied are you with your mattress? What was your store experience like? What features are you looking for? What kind of price point are you prepared to, to pay? Different types of questions to understand what is the consumer thinking about? How can we better meet the consumer's needs? Um, and so we, we take this information, we use it for publicity campaigns, but we also provide it to the industry so that the industry can consider it when they're designing and marketing their new products. Next. And we've, we, we look at the consumer as a whole on average, but we also are looking at the different segments. We're, we're differentiating between age groups, men versus women, uh, are you in a family with children at home? Are you empty nesters? Um, do you live in a city? Do you live in the suburbs? Do you live in, the, in rural areas? Because the consuming uh, public is different depending on what segment you're looking at. And this is very inf interesting information for the retailers, but it's also useful for the producers to understand what kind of customer do I want? We also look at what are the motivations for buying a new bed? And this will help the manufacturer and supplier 
prioritize what they're looking for. Certainly comfort and support is maybe obvious, but it's, it's a tremendous motivator for the consumer. But we also know that the, the dimensions of the products, the materials, the reputation of the company is, is important. I think that it's also interesting to see that warranty is, is one of the lower qualities. So often we have manufacturers who, rather than compete on the basis of features, they compete on the basis of warranty. So they say, oh, my product will last 25 years, and therefore you should buy it. Not because my product is the most comfortable, or my product will give you a better night's sleep. And I think that's good that the consumer is not being influenced too much by the warranty. Next. I think we also have to look carefully, at least in the US and perhaps in Turkey also, at what the consumer is willing to pay for the mattress. Uh, it varies, again, by age group, by, by other segments of the market. We need to be aware of that. Are we, are we pricing our product properly? Could we price it a little bit higher for some uh, age groups or some segments, or do we need to be more, more uh, lower priced for some segments? Next slide. Here we look at how have consumer expectation changed over time with regard to what they expect to pay, what they are willing to pay, and what they actually paid. And it's interesting that the, the price that they are actually paying is, is going down, at least in this survey, over time a little bit, but they're willing to pay more. So how can we encourage the consumer to look at the product and say, this feature is worth more? The, you, you get a better night's sleep because of this feature. It will cost you a little bit more, but it's worth it. How do we convey that to the consumer? So let's look at what some of the future threats are to our industry. We're in a very dynamic time. Things are changing. But what are some of the factors that we need to think about? In the United States, the government is a big factor in terms of how we sell our product, how we make our product. Uh, one of the things that we do from an advocacy point of view is defend the industry in, in the legislature. Uh, there are many environmental groups that want to uh, limit the types of materials we use. I honestly feel that the materials we're using are very safe, very uh, healthy, uh, but we need to be able to convey that point to the, the regulators, to the legislators. Uh, so often the press likes to, to criticize industry, and so our job is to explain what industry is doing to help the consumer so that we have a safe and restful night's sleep. We also expect that in the United States we will have more detailed labeling requirements. We will have to disclose in more detail what's in our products. Um, there's also going to be increasing pressure on the industry to recycle. Uh, fortunately, we've developed a system that works well, um, and it's been effective. We've recycled 10 million mattresses so far, and so we're ready when the states start pushing us. Uh, we're prepared to negotiate with them and, and try to come to a practical solution. Um, Nassif also asked me to talk about what some of the legal requirements are, because doing business in Turkey or in Europe is different than doing business in the United States. Probably the most important factor that you need to keep in mind in selling to the U.S. is our fire standards. Um, historically, uh, mattresses have been somewhat dangerous, especially for people who fall asleep in bed with a cigarette. Uh, we, we now must meet two types of fire standards. One is a what we call a smoldering fire standard, and the other is an open flame standard. Um, so the first was to deal with cigarettes. The second is to deal with candles and lighters. Uh, we often have children in America that play with matches and, and lighters. And unfortunately, they can light their beds on fire and it causes, it kills them. Um, and so we've got two standards that we must meet. They're both quite demanding. Uh, they require actual testing and documentation to show that you are meeting those standards. So if you're thinking about exporting to the United States, either finished product or components, keep this in mind. Un be prepared for your customer to say, but how does it pre pre perform in a fire? And so you may want to do some testing beforehand and certainly learn the rules. A uh, Couple of other things real quick. Uh, one is that if you sell children's products, there are some special rules you need to be aware of. Uh, lead content. Uh, sometimes the pigments in some of the dyes or some of the prints will have uh, lead in them, so you need to be aware of that. 
and then phthalates. Phthalates are a chemical that's used to, uh, often in a waterproof covering, and so if you're selling a bed for, for babies, it may have a, a plastic cover on it. You need to make sure what the chemicals are in that plastic cover because you may not be able to sell those in the United States. And then on the federal side, you also need to be careful about what types of health claims you make. For example, during COVID, some companies were promoting their fabric on the basis that it would be antiviral or antibacterial. And in the United States, we can't make those kinds of claims unless we get approval from the government. The government requires a certain amount of documentation and proof before we can make those claims. And if you don't do that, you can be fined. So be careful in terms of how you market the health claims. Uh, you need to make sure that you comply with the government regulations before you do that. At the state level, there are also requirements. We have, as you may know, federal regulation and then state regulation. And some of the states will limit the materials we use in products, and they will also have their own specific requirements for labeling. So if you're selling into the United States, think about which areas of the country you want to deliver to, which kind of consumers you want to appeal to, and then make sure that you comply with those local rules. Then I'll, I'll, I'll finish my discussion today to talk about recycling. Recycling has become a big issue in the United States. Uh, we have approximately 15 million units of mattresses and box springs that are discarded every year. And when you think about the volume, that's a huge amount of space that they take up. Uh, we created the Mattress Recycling Council to try to address this problem. At this, at this point, we are able to recycle 70% or more of the, of the weight of each mattress. And I should emphasize that when we talk about recycling, we're not talking about burning the product. We're talking about dismantling the product and reusing the steel, the foam, the fiber, and the wood to make new products. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, since uh, 2015, when the, the program first started, we've recycled more than 10 million units. We've diverted over 175,000, or nearly 175,000 metric tons of steel, foam, and other material from landfills. And that saved 7.6 million cubic meters of space in our landfills. So we're making an impact. When we negotiate with states to develop these mattress programs, we insist on four features in the laws. First, we want the program to be run by the industry. We don't want the program to be run by the government. We want to make sure that we can coordinate with the manufacturers, the retailers, and the consumer so that it's as easy a process as possible. We are worried that the government, if they try to do it, they will disrupt the, the sales process, and we want to avoid that. Uh, we want to have the, the, the recycling effort funded by the consumer. Um, one of the big debates in the United States is who pays for recycling? Is it the industry or is it the consumer? And for a product like ours, which is, has a 10, 15, 20 year useful life, uh, where consumers move from different parts of the country to other areas where you can't necessarily find the manufacturer of a product anymore, they may have gone out of business or they may have been sold, we think that a fee paid by the consumer when she buys a new mattress is the most equitable and most efficient way to do this. So that's one of the minimum requirements that we have. Um, what does that fee pay for? Uh, well, some of the challenges are funding, as I said. Uh, the fee pays for how we collect the units. Uh, we will take, uh, we will hire trucks to pick up uh, the units from retailers from the solid waste facilities, from hotels. Uh, in California last year, we, we paid for 14,000 truckloads of mattresses to come into our system. Uh, we also use the money to improve our operations, to find new and better markets for our, our raw materials, and we work with the manufacturers to try to build circularity into how they produce and design products. We want to work with the, the uh, manufacturer to think about how can we make your product easier to recycle at the end of its useful life? Next. So as I said, we pay for the, the containers and the trucks to pick up the mattresses. We transport them to the recycling facilities. We pay the recyclers to de deconstruct the mattresses. We also spend some of our money to help educate the consumer. Uh, we want to have the fee on the invoice that the consumer pays 
We want the consumer to say, why is this here? And we explain to them, the reason you're paying a little bit more for your mattress is so that your old mattress can be recycled properly. And that's a very good conversation to have. Almost all of the consumers understand this after we explain it to them, and they're supportive of what we're doing. We also use a small part of the money to research uh, new uses for our materials, and then we work with the government to make sure that uh, our program is working properly and that the retailers are doing their job as well. To communicate with the consumer, we use in-store materials, we have signage, we have a small card that, we give the that the retailer provides to the consumer uh, when the purchase is made. We have TV and radio ads, we use social media, and then we also participate in community fairs and other community events to explain who the Mattress Recycling Council is. Often we'll have a trailer there and they can take their used mattress to the fair if they want to and get rid of it there. Uh, we spend about a million dollars a year on research. Uh, we've had 20 or more projects since 2018 that are focused on improving efficiency and new uses for mattress materials. Next slide. Our goals are to increase the, the recycling rate to 75% or more, to improve the financial health of our recyclers. We want the recyclers to prosper. We want them to, to, to be successful. And we can help them be successful if we can find better markets and better uses for the raw materials. Without the recyclers, our program fails. So we want them to be around a long time. We also want to be more environmentally efficient when we're doing our, our work. I mentioned that we had 14,000 truckloads of mattresses uh, in California last year. We're working on some new technology to compress the number of mattresses, to compress the mattresses in our trucks so we can put more into the trucks. We'd like to take that 14,000 number and reduce it to 10,000 because that would be less fuel that we'd be consuming, less carbon we'll be burning. Uh, diversifying the end markets is important. Uh, in the United States, one of the biggest uses for, car for, for the foam is to make cushions for the pad, for the carpet. Uh, we, in the United States, the tradition is to have a, a small layer of foam and then you put the carpet on top of that. But there's only so much carpet pad that we can make, so we're looking to use uh, uh, rebonded foam to clean up oil spills for packaging materials, maybe for cushioning materials in, in car chairs and other things. Uh, and then we also want to anticipate what are the next challenges. Some of the materials we get into our recycling facility are very difficult to recycle. For example, the pocketed coils. Pocketed coils are a wonderful product. They provide a very good support system for the, the consumer, but at the end of the useful life, they are very difficult to, to recycle. And so we've developed a new machine that will help us take the steel out of the pocket of coil, but we want to understand what are the next challenges so that by the time those products hit the recycling stream, we're ready for them. Some of the more interesting projects that we're working on is using the foam and fiber from a mattress uh, to make battery electrodes. We put it through a process that carbonizes the material, and that carbon can be then used in, in large capacity batteries. We've done a lot of work there, and hopefully that will become uh, a marketable uh, technology shortly. We're using um, some of the foam material. We change it a little bit chemically, mix it with a, a material called zeolite, and we can make uh, low energy cement. It, we, don't, we couldn't use the cement to build buildings, but we can use it for paving, for, for sound walls, sound barriers, uh, and it's, it's a much more energy efficient type of cement. Um, we are taking, uh, using a process to heat and compress the foam, and it will change it into a material that could be used for, for shoe soles, for grips on tools, ha uh, hammers and screwdrivers, um, and we think that this could be a very good value add for the scrap foam. We're also looking at using uh, some of the foam and the wood to make particle board so that we can try to raise the recycling rate. Other things we're looking at is oil absorbing foam, textile recycling. We use a lot of blended textiles and separating the fibers is very difficult. So we're doing research to look at how can we use enzymes to separate the fiber. For example, if we have a cotton, uh, cotton uh, polyurethane, uh, no, cotton polyester blend, we have enzymes that will eat the cotton 
and leave the polyester behind. That could be a very efficient way of separating uh, the, the fibers. In order to understand what the product mix is that's coming into our, our recyclers, we're also conducting an age study so that we know product from 15 years ago is now coming in. What did those products, uh, how, how were those products built? This will help our recyclers anticipate what their needs are. And then we're also working on fire risks. Uh, as you may know, polyurethane foam is very flammable. And so we want to work with our recyclers to make sure they understand the risks that they can protect their workers, protect their plant, and also protect the image. We don't want MRC to be associated with dangerous fires. So we're working with our recyclers to make sure that they are safe. The last thing I want to talk about for MRC is another program that we've created called the Sleep Products Sustainability Program, or SP2. SP2 is an effort to help our manufacturers be more efficient in how they make new product. We work with them to develop continuous improvement systems so that they can be more efficient in how they consume raw materials, uh, try to reduce waste, reduce the amount of energy and water that they use in their manufacturing facilities. By doing this, we will also be helping improve the sustainability of the industry. Next. And that's all of my comments for today. I hope that you've gotten some, some useful information. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Halit from Motis. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm wondering, you know, uh, starting from June 2020 till uh, June 2021. Yes. Uh, there was a skyrocketing rocket, sales uh, in all over the world. I yes. Mean, especially in our industry. So, but after June 21 to the 2021, you know, it, uh, it's, uh, it started to slow down, you know. So for the last, let's say, one year, uh, the industry is not uh, like the year before. Yes. So can you give us some information about the U.S. market uh, sales figures uh, for the last period? I mean, let's say it's for the last two, three quarters. The last two or three quarters have been bad. Uh, sales have been down 20, 25 percent. Um, and part of that is because, as you said, uh, during the 2021 period, consumers were staying at home. Consumers were trying to be healthful. They were trying to improve their home. They had nowhere else to go. And so sales that we would be making next year, we made last year. So uh, we brought forward future sales. So that would logically mean that the future will be a little bit smaller. But we are also entering a recession in the United States. The economy is slowing down. We know from our, our econometric research that mattress sales are good when you have high disposable income, you have good housing sales, and you have consumer confidence that their, their savings are, 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 are healthy. And right now, all three of them are bad. Uh, disposable income is being eroded by inflation. The housing market is, is not good. And the stock market has fallen substantially. So my retirement fund, I have to work a few more years now because my retirement fund is smaller. So all of those are conspiring against us to create a bad market condition. The future depends on how bad the recession becomes. Will it be a soft landing or will it be a deep recession? I think we're all hoping it will be a soft landing, but even a soft landing won't be good for the mattress industry until at least six months from now. I think that we have uh, another six months of, of softness, then hopefully we will improve. Um, one of the things that we had this year was a inventory problem as well. In the United States, historically, our inventories have been very small, uh, but we had the huge demand by the consumer during COVID and yet a shortage of supply. And so many retailers ordered too much and then the market flattened. And so you had retailers with huge supplies and no, no sales. And so that we needed to work through that inventory for the manufacturer that meant even lower sales. So I think we've worked through the inventory problem, but now the demand is, not, is low. We need to wait till demand improves and then, then units will improve. Um, one of the first slides I showed was the, the market trends over 20 years. And one of the typical uh, patterns that we have in this industry is that after a recession is over, 
demand is good. We have pent up demand, consumers are more confident, and that is the case in almost every recession. So hopefully that will be our future. We just have to, to, to be patient, and then the, the demand will improve. Can we say, uh, you know, uh, if people stay at home during the pandemic and then they spend money for furniture, to, uh, I mean, uh, renew the furniture and mattresses, and then the, after that they couldn't go anywhere in the world for the vacation. Right. So now, can we say the contract business will go up in the next, uh, after six months, because, you know, the hotels were fully booked? Perhaps. But at the same time, during that COVID period, nobody was using the hotels. So they, they may push out their, their replacement cycle too. Um, you're an optimist, that's good, but I'm not sure that that, that will necessarily um, compensate for the loss in consumer demand. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you for listening to me this morning. I have really have had a very good time here in, in Turkey. It's been wonderful to meet so many of the Turkish companies and to experience the, uh, the trade show here. I wish you all a tremendous success and hopefully we'll make it through the recession very well and we, we look forward to, to, to talking again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.